Parametric equations are commonly used when designing parts that will be rotating under operation. They of course have other applications, but when designing parts like cams, which is where a rotating component is in sliding contact with another component that moves linearly and periodically, understanding parametric equations has great value. For example, as this camshaft rotates, the sliding contact with the red components on top move up and down. The amplitude and overall behavior of the periodic linear motion of the red shaft followers are controlled by the profile of the cams. For around half a rotation, each red follower is not moving at all. And then, because the radius of the cam is larger for some angle values, the followers are being pushed upward. In this case, the reason for wanting this type of motion is for the rest of the follower mechanism to keep a valve closed most of the time and then open for a brief period of time every time the shaft rotates. Just to back up a little for what we're gonna be covering today, if you remember from your trick class, parametric equations are those that are written as functions of at least one independent variable called the parameter. For example, we can define a circle using parametric equations. If x is equal to 5 cosine of an angle theta and y is 5 sine of theta, we can vary the angle, which is the parameter in this example, from 0 to 2 pi or 0 to 360 if you're using degrees instead of radians to evaluate both parametric equations at different angles. If theta is 0, x would be 5 times cosine of 0, which is 1, meaning x is 5 times 1 or just 5. Y would be 5 times sine of 0, which is 0, and therefore Y is 0. The XY coordinate for the point we would plot would be 5 comma 0. If theta is 30 degrees, X would be square root of 3 over 2 times 5, and Y would be 1 half of 5. If we continue with the other values of theta, like 45, 60, 90, we see that when we plot all XY coordinates, we get 1 fourth of a plot of a circle of radius 5. And of course, if we evaluate the x and y values for degrees between 90 and 360, we would get the rest of the plot of the circle. Now, these parametric equations seem more complex than just using polar coordinates, right? If we were just using an explicit equation in polar coordinates, all we would do is define r equal to 5. Technically, r is a function of theta, but since theta is nowhere to be seen here, it means that for any angle theta, r is equal to 5. Theta equal to 0, r is 5. Theta equal to 30, r is 5. Theta equal to 180, r is still 5. This is like saying in Cartesian coordinates that y is equal to 2. If y is technically a function of x, but x is not part of that equation, x can be 0, 1, 4, 7, whatever, and y would still be 2. We would get the same when plotting the radius 5. So even though polar coordinates are sometimes easier to work with, understanding how explicit functions in polar coordinates can be translated into parametric equations in Cartesian coordinates is very helpful for designs like these. So I suggest checking out the links below to the video summaries of basic trick concepts related to polar coordinates and parametric equations before moving forward. What must be clear before you proceed is that the x component of any r theta coordinate can be found by multiplying the radius times the cosine of theta and that the y component of any r theta coordinate can be found by multiplying the radius times sine of theta. This is just basic vector components math. So just as a quick review, if you do remember those basics, let's plot the equation of a cardioid in polar coordinates. If r is equal to 4 minus 3 sine of theta, we can evaluate r, which is a function of theta, for different values of theta. For example, for theta equal to 0, r is equal to 4. Therefore, at a 0 degree angle, the value of r is 4. For theta equal to 30, sine of 30 is 1 half, and therefore r is 2.5. So on the 30 degree line, r has a length of 2.5. For theta equal to 45, sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2, and therefore r is just below 2. This means that on the 45 degree angle line, r is 1.879. For theta equal to 60, r is 1.4. So at 60 degrees, the length goes down to 1.4. And finally, at theta equal to 90, r is 1. When we do this for angles between 0 and minus 90, we're effectively subtracting the negative values of what we just got. And therefore, we end up with larger values in the fourth quadrant, that is, the bottom right one. 
And since the sine function is an odd function, in polar coordinates this means that the plot is symmetric, forming the shape of a heart, ergo the cardioid name for the function. So why is a plot like this important? Notice that the difference between a circle of radius 4 and the cardioid is precisely the sine function. If we were to plot the sine function between 0 and 360, we would get this. As the sine increases in the first quadrant, meaning between 0 and 90 degrees, the difference between the circle of radius 4 and the cardioid also increases. And this is why all of this is important. If we want our follower to move up and down, exactly like this sine function, over time, or what is the same over the camp's rotation, we are effectively finding the function that describes the surface and therefore the shape of our cam element. But let's keep it simple for today's SOLIDWORKS example. Let's say our rotating element is only gonna rotate 150 degrees. And we just want our follower to move linearly from 3 inches to 5 inches away from the center of rotation. This means that the rotating element will have a radius of 3 inches at 0 degrees and 5 inches at 150 degrees so that when it rotates, the follower is being pushed from 3 to 5 inches away from the center. Since this is a linear relationship, we can use basic algebra and its description of a straight line y equal to mx plus b. Of course, in this case, we want a linear relation between the radius and theta, not y and x. With this equation, we can find the slope m and, in this case, the r-intercept b. If r must be 3 when theta is 0, it means that b is equal to 3. Therefore, r is equal to m theta plus 3. And since r has to be equal to 5 when theta is 150 degrees, or 5 pi over 6 radians, then m is equal to 12 over 5 pi, and therefore the polar equation is r equal to 12 over 5 pi times theta plus 3. Now recalling what we just reviewed, that to go from polar to Cartesians, x is always r cosine of theta, and y is always r sine of theta, we can substitute the r equation we just found to get our parametric equations for this part. So let's create our part in SOLIDWORKS, easiest part of these lectures. If we go into a sketch, and let's say choose the front plane, we can hit the spline drop-down options to reveal the equation-driven curve function. The equation type can either be explicit or parametric. Explicit would be a typical y equals to a function of x, and parametric would be x and y in terms of a parametric variable t, for example. In our case, t would be theta. So we choose parametric, and we type the functions into the x and y boxes. x is equal to 12 over 5 pi times t plus 3, all of this times cosine of t. And y would be exactly the same first term, which is what describes the radius, times sine instead of cosine. And we want our theta, in this case t, to go from 0 to 5 pi over 6. And done! Here we can make sure that the values are correct. For example, at a 0 degree angle, the distance between the origin and the line should be 3. We create a center line from the origin at 0 degrees and measure it to be 3. And that's good. We create another center line, set it to make a 150 degree angle, trim the excess, and measure its distance, and great, it's 5, just like we wanted. We can even check for any other values of theta. For example, if this is in fact a linear relation, which is what we wanted, right at the middle between 0 and 150, meaning 75 degrees, the distance from the origin should be right at the middle between 3 and 5, right? We create a center line, we angle it at 75 degrees, we trim the excess, and we measure it, and voila! It's 4 inches. And there you have it. All we do after this is make it an actual part. We could create a couple of circles at both ends, make them tangent to the main curve, draw those center lines passing through the origin, add some lines and make them parallel and tangent, maybe a fillet on the other side. And since we expect this part to be rotating, we make a hole right at the origin, which is the center of rotation. After exiting the sketch, we give it a depth with the extruded boss option, and we are done. We now know how to use the equation-driven curve function to make a sketch that follows any type of curve described by a mathematical equation for whatever application we need it for.
The links to the other lectures of the SOLIDWORKS course are down in the description below, so don't forget to check those out, as well as the links to the other engineering courses. Thanks for watching.